Hi guys, it's Natalie Zangon here and um, there was a request that I got regarding how I remember Judaism being practiced back when I was living in Iran. I was born in Iran. I moved here when I was in elementary school and we moved here after, after the revolution that happened. So some of the things I wanted to share with you guys is in back in Iran, I do not remember at all any sort of the braided bread that is used now for Shabbat being used on Shabbat table back in Iran. We never had that. Um, we, I remember clearly that my grandfather and my grandfather would tell me that his grandfather would always tell them that on Friday night you need to have two complete loaves of bread. Doesn't matter, barbari, sangak, um, whatever, lavash, because of the story of when the Jews were in Mitzrayim, there was two loaves of bread the two mana that came out on Friday. So therefore on Friday night on Shabbat, you need to have two loaves of bread. So whether it was like flat bread or like a baguette or barberry or whatever, um, all of it was accepted. Again, any type of bread is good. So I'm making my bread for Shabbat. This is how I like to do it. I flatten it out. I put it on the tray and I put it in the oven. You can also bake it on the stove top. It comes out flat like where you what you bake your um, rice in uh, with a Teflon pan. It comes out really nice and fluffy. So another thing I wanted to tell you is that the Jews that live in Iran, Iran is one of the countries that has the most ancient history of Judaism in it. You know, after the destruction of this first Beit HaMikdash, uh, between the first and the second when the mm -hmm. Babylonian took over the Jews m Migrated all over the world and they also went to Iran and that's how we know that the story of Purim Queen Esther took place in Iran So Iran has one of the most historical Jewish backgrounds close to like um, 1500 years ago Jews lived in Iran and when Cyrus helped to build the second Beit HaMikdash Sorry, I'm just bringing out the bread that I put in the oven. When, when he helped to build the second Beit Tamikdash, hold on one second. And these are the ones that came out a bit more crispy. When he helped <coughs> to build the second Beit Tamikdash, um, there are thoughts that not all the Jews went back to Israel, so some stayed back behind in Iran. So there's a lot of beautiful books and writings, there was a book I want to show you, about the Jews and the Queen, you know, Ahasuerus and the historical um, uh, things that Jews brought and you know, the other stories that how Ahasuerus wanted to use some of the, um, some of the silverware and stuff from the Beit HaMikdash that they took. So Judaism in Iran has a very rich ancient historical backing to it. I wanted to show you, this is a Kiddushka. This is handwritten from Esfahan. It's silver. As you see, one side of it has a Star of David, which is Sion. The middle one has a menorah and then a picture of grape juice. These were the kind of cups that was used back in Iran for Kiddush. Very historical, majority were all out of like pure silver, very elegant, very rich. The Shabbat candles were also the same way. And many, many of the menorahs in Iran for Hanukkah look like this with the lions and the 12 Shabbat team. Very symbolic and things from the time of the Beit HaMikdash. And a lot of the Sidurs in Iran also had this beautiful shape to it, silver um, outing and, you know, very historical and ancient looking like the stuff from the Beit HaMikdash. So what happened was during the time, like uh, let's say um, 500 years ago, the Jews were more practicing that were like more religious, more observant. And from what I hear is that during like, let's say my great grandparents' time, there were a lot more practicing. But when Shah came to Iran and you know, the regime changed and everyone modernized, people started keeping less and less mitzvot. But 
during my grandmother's time and her grandmother, like let's say approximately 150 years ago, they used to cover their hair. I remember like my, my grandmother from my father's side, if she was alive, she would be like 100 something. Um, she used to always cover her hair with a scarf, with a tichel, and her hair would never be seen unless she was taking a shower. Even during bedtime, there was never seen. Um, sorry, we have a here. Sorry, mama. Okay, sorry, mama. Sorry, sorry. So, um, is it is it okay if I finish this and then I tell? So during um. During her time, she was very, very um, important for her to make sure she her hair is covered. She kept nude, and she used to tell a story about she was from Tuserkan, which is very close to Hamadan, where the story of Shushan Purim happened. She used to tell a story about the mikveh and how they used to break the ice and the lake to go in there and to be able to do the mikveh time, and they would do it under you know very there were very thing in it. And what's interesting that even with the laws of Nida, they kept some practices like during the time of the Beit HaMikdash, which I always wondered, why are they so strict about it? It's like, I don't get why are they t keeping all these extra mitzvot. It was sort of like from what they remember from their grandparents, their great-grandparents brought from with them from the timing of the Beit HaMikdash. So... The netila, like washing netila, we had a silver cup that they would do netila at your dying with. The woman used to always light candles, girls or married women. Kashrut, the milk was fine because, you know, Muslims also only drink cow milk. But the shechita would be done by the mother of the house. They knew how to do from A to Z. I'm sorry, not the shechita. After the shochet would shechita the chicken then the woman knew how to clean it themselves or they would go to tehran hamadan um esfahan and yad to buy stuff from because that's where they had most of the jews um the jews in mashad um, went through a very hard time with the assimilation and a lot of jews were um forced oh, i'm sorry mama i'm gonna come right now okay go ahead Um, Jews, a lot of the Jews in Iran also were forced to convert to become Baha'i. So there's a lot of lost tribes of Jews that converted to being Baha'i. And, you know, they do some things that are very similar to Jews, but they're not sure where they got it from, you know, whether it's the lighting of the candle and setting up a table on Shabbat and some other things. And many of them were either bribed or like, you know, um, invited to convert. So Judaism is very, very rich. Iranian Jews have a very ancient historical um, teaching of Judaism with them from many, many years ago. Um, I'm hoping to upload more of these videos. Wanted to wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom. We also used to eat gondi. What Ashkenazis eat like filter mm -hmm. fish. We used to eat gondi, which is like meat. Uh, chicken meatball we'll talk about it later and rice and choresh and um, warm it up on either like a plate or put a metal thing on the stove and keep it warm we never baked food on shabbat or cooked food on shabbat we knew that you're not um supposed to do that thank you so much for watching this is natalie zangan at gmail.com shabbat shalom